Hello beautiful friends and bookish fam. My name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. Today we are here to talk about the lowest rated books I've ever read according to Goodreads. So back during Bookmas, I did a video called The Best Books I've Ever Read According to Goodreads, where I went to Goodreads and I sorted all of my read books by average rating and I went through the highest rated books according to Goodreads and talked to you about whether or not I agreed with the ratings. And so today I thought I would do the same thing but with the lowest rated books. Now I haven't really thoroughly gone through this list, I just kind of skimmed through it, but I can tell you that a lot of these books were read a long time ago and so I don't necessarily remember all of the details. So I thought it would be kind of fun to go through and see what I said in my Goodreads reads reviews about these as well. I do remember very vividly not liking these books but I don't necessarily remember what they are about or some of my specific thoughts so we're going to kind of revisit this together. So without further ado let's go ahead and jump right in. The very first book that I have to talk to you about is actually quite a surprise because it's a pretty new release. It was released in the later part of 2022 and it was the last book that I read in 2022. It is The Rewind by Alison Winscotch. This has a 3.23 average rating on Goodreads. That's kind of telling about how unremarkable remarkable this book is. So this book is supposed to be a second chance romance. It follows our main characters Frankie and Ezra and they were basically college sweethearts but on the day of graduation they broke up and it was a very contentious breakup. They kind of vowed never to see or speak to each other ever again and they managed to do that for a decade. But now they are both returning to their college campus for the wedding of a mutual friend and so they're kind of bent on avoiding each other. They don't want to see each other, they don't want to talk to each other. But on the morning of the wedding they both wake up in bed together in their old college dorm and not only that but Frankie is wearing Ezra Ezra's grandmother's wedding ring. So she's got a ring on her finger, Ezra's next to her, and neither one of them has any memory of what happened. And so the book is really following them as they are trying to piece together the events of the night before, trying to figure out how they ended up in this space. So I obviously had a lot of technical issues with this story, and I remember them very vividly because, like I said, it's only been five months since I read the story. This is a very, very new release. So first and foremost is I had a really hard time suspending my disbelief for the fact that there are two characters in here and neither one of them remember the night before. I find that highly improbable, no matter how how much they drank that both of them would have almost no memory of the night before. That was very, very implausible to me. But also we are supposed to believe that Frankie and Ezra belong together. This is a second chance romance. So we're supposed to feel the chemistry and the angst and the want and the love. But Alison Winscotch did not do a good job of putting that on paper. She did not convince me that these two characters should be together. I felt the hate. The hate was palpable. She did a fantastic job of making me believe that Frankie and Ezra truly hate each other. But considering these characters have spent the past 10 years not wanting anything to do to each other, there wasn't enough time in like this 24 or 48 hour period for all of that to have a resolution and for them to come back together so seamlessly, especially when the night before they're basically at each other's throats. Like the entirety of this time they're fighting, they're not having a great time, but yet all of a sudden by the end of this book I'm supposed to believe that they're setting aside the past 10 years and they want to get together when that is not indicated in this book whatsoever. There's hardly any chemistry with these characters and so I just didn't believe that Frankie and Ezra were meant to be together. She didn't sell me on this relationship. Here's a blurb that I put in my Goodreads review and it's kind of mean. This is going to sound unnecessarily cruel but when I was reading this I felt like I was reading the budget store brand version of Emily Henry. What I really wanted is for Emily Henry to write this story because I feel the execution would have been much better not to mention the banter and sexual chemistry. So that kind of sums up my feelings on this story. So do I agree with the low ratings for this? Yes. With the rating this low most people are giving it like two and three stars and I have to agree. Does it deserve to be the worst book on here? No. Some of the books that I'm about to talk to you about I really feel deserve to be a lower rating than the rewind but yeah a three point two three sounds about right. And then the next book that is on this list at a 3.30 is Honestly We Meant Well by Grant Ginder. I remember the only reason why I read this is because it was sent to me by the publisher. This was at the time when I was still very heavily involved in my bookstagram and my bookstagram was getting more and more popular and so the publisher reached out to me to see if I wanted to review this and on the outset it sounded kind of fun and so I agreed but ultimately it was just it was just mediocre and fairly forgettable. What I remember about this is it's a family drama that follows a woman who I believe she goes to Greece and her troubles basically follow her there. This is the synopsis. It says the Wright family is in ruins. Sue Ellen Wright has what she thinks is a close to perfect life. A terrific career as a classics professor, a loving husband, and a son who is just about to safely leave the nest. But then disaster strikes. She learns that her husband is cheating and that her son has made a complete mess of his life. So when the opportunity to take her family to a Greek island for a month presents itself, she jumps at the chance. This sunlit paradise with its mountains and beaches is, after all, where she first fell in love with both a man and with an ancient culture. Perhaps Sue Ellen's past will 
will provide the key to her and her family's salvation. So at the core of the story, this is about a family. It's about a very flawed family who go on this Greek vacation in order to escape the problems of their lives. But the problems find them when the husband's mistress ends up finding them in Greece. And it kind of goes from there. Each of the characters is struggling. They all have their own baggage and things of that nature. So it was just a very standard family type of drama. My review says that I actually gave this a 3.5 out of 5 stars. So I enjoyed this more than I think most people did. But I don't, of course, remember a ton of it. I do remember enjoying each character individually, but yet they were also unlikable characters. So you're not necessarily supposed to like them or root for them, but I enjoyed following each individual character within this story. Is this something that I would pick up today and enjoy today? Probably not, especially as my reading tastes have changed. I can probably see why I enjoyed this to the level that I did, just because it was fun, lighthearted, somewhat character driven, probably a comedy of errors in a lot of cases. I can see why I gave this a 3.5 out of 5. So I seem to be right at, if not above, the average rating for this story. Would I recommend it? No. It wasn't mind-blowing. It wasn't brilliant. It might be a good palette cleanser if you're looking for that, but this was nothing phenomenal whatsoever. I didn't even end up keeping the arc that I was given, so it is definitely gone from my life, gone from my house, gone from my memory, and it was just, it was just okay, you know? Just an okay, mediocre family drama. Next at a 3.36 is Fireworks by Katie Catunio. Katie Catunio is typically a YA author. Back when I read this, she was a very popular YA author. I don't know how many books she has released since then because after this book I was never going to read anything else by her ever again. But I definitely heard her name a lot in the online bookish community. That's what inspired me to pick up a book by her to begin with. And of course back then I was still reading YA which I definitely do not now. I would not even bother with this story now. I even mentioned in my review here when I picked this story up and this was almost five years ago it had a 3.42 rating. So even at that time it was the lowest rated book on my TBR and I went into it with high hopes. I had high hopes that I was going to enjoy it a lot more than everybody else, but I did not. What I remember of this story, it follows two best friends. It says the names are Olivia and Dana. And I remember that Olivia was the talented one and she always had kind of big dreams of being a star. Dana was always the more reserved and level-headed one. And both of the girls are going to Orlando because Olivia wants to be part of this girl band that is being put together. But during the auditions, Dana is also discovered too. And that was never supposed to happen. It was always supposed to be Olivia. Olivia wanted the fame. She wanted the stardom. Dana did not want any of that. But soon she and Olivia are kind of thrust together with these other girls and they're training to be pop stars and it kind of goes from there. Definitely a light, fluffy, superficial story without any meat and that was like one of my main complaints about this story. So I actually did bullet points for my gripes about this book. Um, one was pacing. Everything happened really quickly. It went from Olivia and Dana auditioning to them giving live performances by midway through the story. The first half of the book takes place only within a month's time which seems oddly fast for such events to occur which of course then makes it very very difficult for you to connect overall to the characters. There was instant love in here as well like a boy was just kind of thrown in for no real reason. The characters were all very very unlikable obviously. Girl drama was probably my biggest complaint about this. Olivia basically turns on Dana instantaneously. She basically throws away their lifelong friendship and is fully consumed by being the star, being the one in the spotlight. She cannot believe that Dana has the nerve to be there with her, that Dana was also selected. Dana this nobody. What on earth is she doing there with Olivia? So Olivia basically turns her back. It escalates by the end of the story and it's not even ever really resolved. So you have all this girl drama for no reason aside from it being girl drama. And girl drama is one of the things that I absolutely hate seeing in books. It's so overdone. It's so overplayed. And that's not what I want to see anymore. Like I want to see girls and women being there for each other and lifting each other up. So fireworks was definitely not for me. I absolutely think it deserves the low rating here. And in fact, out of the three that I've mentioned so far, I think that this deserves to be the lowest rated. Not the rewind, not honestly we meant well, but this one. It's not even a book that I would recommend to people who like YA. I would not recommend this book. But I mean, if you've liked Katie Coutinho in the past, go ahead and give her a shot. I just did not think that this was a strong book at all. So book number four that I want to talk to you about today was also one of the lowest rated books on my TBR when I read it. And it obviously hasn't gone up. It's got a 3.39 with 2,702 ratings. That is The Girl from Blind River by Gail Massey. Now I will say that I remember actually overall having a pretty positive reading experience with this. It wasn't the best thing that I ever read, but I didn't hate it at all. And I don't even remember coming out of it with any particularly strong negative feelings. I did give it a 3.5 out of 5, which sounds about right. To me, this wasn't a forgettable meh bleh type of read, but it wasn't anything that could potentially be a favorite, which is what I reserve four plus stars to. So this follows our main character, Janie Elders. She has not had a charmed life. Her father died when she was young. Her mother was just released from prison after 10 years, and she and her brother have been in the care of Uncle Loyal, who is not a stellar representation of a human being. Jamie is determined to leave behind Blind River and the reputation of her family. She is a poker savant and plans on using this talent to earn big and forever leave behind where she grew up. This plan is put at risk one day when a serious lapse in judgment puts her in debt with her uncle. Now she must do whatever he asks or face the consequences. The debt comes to 
call all too soon when she has to come with Loyal to clean up a mess made by one of Loyal's longtime partners in crime who has a dead man in his home and Jamie is needed to help dispose of the body. But when it comes to light, the dead man is a former Super Bowl champion and it looks like her brother may be framed for the crime. It is time for Jamie to stand up to her uncle once and for all. So I remember what I really liked about the story is that it had the dark and gritty tones that I really, really enjoy. You have a young person who is growing up in these horrific circumstances. She's being raised by a person who breaks the law. He's a criminal. He's not a child person. He doesn't exactly treat them very well. And all of the things that she has to do to survive and protect her brother and get them both out of there. So I really like the atmosphere of the story, the dark gritty vibes of it. There were definitely no really redeemable characters in here. They were all unlikable in one form or another. And even our main character, who you're definitely supposed to root for, that is a given. You are supposed to root for her. You are wanting her to win. You are wanting her to get out of Blind River. You are wanting her to take down her uncle. But this is not really a story where you connect with the characters. And I don't think you are supposed to. So that again, for me is a detriment because I am a character driven reader. And so if you need to connect with the characters and you can't really do that because they are unlikable or it is a more plot driven story, you are not going to find that connection that you're looking for within this story. So of course this failed to be like a more character driven narrative. I was basically following it and I was intrigued and invested because I wanted to know how Jamie was going to get out. I wanted to know how she was going to take down her uncle and how everything was going to come together. So this definitely wasn't a masterpiece, but would I be willing to read more from this author in the future? Yes. I don't know if she has released anything since this book. I haven't looked into it, but this book was not a deal breaker for me. Do I think it deserves a 3.39? No. But when you're talking about Goodreads, who doesn't allow half star ratings, you either have to give it a three or a four. And so I don't think that this is worthy of a four. So if everybody is giving it a three, then yes, it's going to skew more towards a three than a four. I would say that 3.5 is a more accurate rating for this story. So I probably have some higher opinions of it than other people who have read it. But I definitely don't think this deserves a super high rating. So I would say about 3.5 is more where my opinion of this story lies. Okay, now this next one is one I really, really don't remember. I read this all the way back in 2017, shortly after it was published. It was getting all the hype. It is a young adult horror-ish novel called There's Someone Inside Your House by Stephanie Perkins. This has a 3.40 rating with 35,000 ratings. So this is definitely the most popular book on this list so far. So this is following a main character who after an unfortunate incident in Hawaii, which is where she lived with her parents, she is basically being shipped to rural Nebraska to live with her maternal grandmother, which of course is a very difficult shift as you could imagine going from Hawaii to the Midwest of the United States. And even though it was like a difficult transition, she's kind of settled there. She hates the town, but she's found some meaningful friendships. She's starting to fall in love with a boy. And then all of a sudden she finds herself in the middle of a real life horror novel when her classmates start getting killed one by one. This book was definitely meant, I believe, to have like some scream vibes to it. So that's what Stephanie Perkins was going for with this story. I say in my Goodreads review that this book was about 80% contemporary and 20% thriller and it was often hard to reconcile the two. The vast amount of teen romance offset and lightened what could have been a more intense and intriguing story. I definitely remember not getting the thriller horror vibes that I went in there expecting. Not to mention, if I remember correctly, you find out who the perpetrator is fairly early on in the story. Like this is not a very long story whatsoever. Yeah, it's only 287 pages and we find out who the murderer is halfway through the story. And to me, that takes out the sense of suspense, you know, trying to figure out who did it. Yes, you're still trying to capture this person, but now there's no mystery as to who did it. Ultimately, this just wasn't thrilling. So a 3.4 rating, I feel is pretty accurate. I feel it's pretty just. I rated this a three stars. I don't think it deserved anything more than that. So I'm actually kind of surprised that it is it's higher, it's like more towards the 3.5. So yeah, I would say 3.40 is definitely deserved. Next, sadly, is a Katrina Leno. It is You Must Not Miss. It has a 3.41 rating. I love Summer of Salt by Katrina Leno. That is one of my favorite young adult stories of all time. And because I loved it so much, I was determined to read everything that she had ever written. I went on to read another story called, I think it was called Everything All at Once. And that was okay. Like it wasn't anything amazing. It definitely didn't hit me like Summer of Salt did. And then I went on into You Must Not Miss. And even to this day, I still don't know what I read in that book. I don't remember hardly anything about it. I just remember being thoroughly and utterly confused and it didn't even feel like a Katrina Leno to me. It didn't give me the soft magic vibes that I was getting from the other two books. This was just a little bit weird in my overall opinion. So this is following a main character named Magpie and as is typical YA fashion, she is definitely going through a lot in her teenage years. Her life has basically spiraled out of control in recent years as she caught her father mid-coitus with her aunt. And so naturally that didn't sit well with her mother because her husband has 
cheated on her and not only has he cheated on her but he has cheated on her with her own sister that caused her to spiral downward back into alcoholism so she is basically a neglectful parent at this point point. and then Magpie's own sister has kind of like jumped ship she's gone off I think she might have gone off to college or something like that because she just couldn't handle being there around the family anymore it was just a toxic environment so Magpie is essentially just left on her own and so Magpie has just basically kind of lost all will all motivation and she doesn't do her schoolwork she has no friends and she just kind of spends her time lost in this world of her own imagination called Nier. And then one day the powerful emotions that Magpie is feeling causes Nier to become real. And so Magpie can literally go into this world and escape into it. And within Nier are like different versions of the people who are there in her real life. And so she starts using Nier as kind of a conduit, a way to get revenge on all of the people that have wronged her. So this is a blurb that I wrote. I said, I am honestly stuck between wondering if this was simply an overly metaphorical book that went straight over my head or if this was magical realism done poorly where nothing was truly developed, everything was confusing, and the end seemed very ambiguous and lacked closure. That is basically my overall thoughts on this. I was just very confused and underwhelmed throughout the entirety of this story. I said, Magpie is obviously dealing with quite a bit of traumatic and heavy issues, none of which are explored in great detail. We simply see Magpie deal with these by not dealing. With regard to Nier, I said, there's not much exploration of this world. All we know is that it is basically the equivalent of where Magpie lives, but without flaw. Everything in Nier is perfect, and in Nier, Magpie can conjure almost everything she wants, but there is a consequence to doing so. So basically, I wish that there had been a lot more development. I wish that there had been a lot more character focus on Magpie and the issues that she was struggling with, because basically she dealt with it by not dealing with it. And so because she wasn't dealing with it, we as the readers were not getting that emotional connection to her. And then we weren't even getting a full exploration of Nier. So there was just so much gray, so much blurriness within the story that I couldn't connect to it. I couldn't really even understand it for the most part. It just did not work for me and the ending didn't work for me either. So I absolutely believe that this deserves a 3.41. In fact, I would put it lower than the rewind in my opinion because I really didn't enjoy the story overall. There wasn't really a whole lot worthwhile about the story which kills me to say because surely this cannot be the same author that wrote The Summer Assault. Even if I were still reading Young Adult, I don't think I would be reading Katrina Leno anymore just because this was such a huge letdown. You'll have to let me know if you read this what your thoughts are because this just really really did not work for me. Next with a 3.42 and 13,000 ratings is Side Effects May Vary by Julie Murphy. This is definitely a book that made me decide never to read a Julie Murphy again and I haven't to this day read a Julie Murphy. I remember hating the main character of the story so so much. If I remember correctly it follows our main character who has a I think it's cancer and she is pretty sure that she is dying and so she decides to use the time that she has left to kind of get revenge against all of the wrongs that have been done to her. And in order to do this she enlists the help of her best friend who just happens to be in love with her. However after she has done all of this revenge she actually goes into remission and she gets better and so now she has to deal with the consequences of all of the actions that she took while she was sick. I had a strong dislike of the main character in this story. I remember hating her with a vengeance. In fact, this is one of the first times that I can remember ever viscerally hating a character so much. She was super selfish. She was mean-spirited. She was using this poor cinnamon roll boy who loved her in order to enact her revenge. So she was bringing him into all of this and using him for her own purposes because she knew how he felt about her. And though she does have real feelings for Harvey, she loves him but not enough to want the responsibility of his happiness so she dangles him by a string jerking him back to her whenever she feels like it. This is especially true when Harvey attempts to move on and date someone else which Alice is unhappy with. She wants him but not fully yet she wants no one else to have him. This book was just awful overall. I think you might be noticing a pattern here that the vast majority of books on this list are YA and this is just one of many reasons why I stopped reading YA. It is just no longer my thing. It's no longer giving me the substance and the depth that I'm looking for. Speaking of another horrific YA, Suicide Notes from Beautiful Girls by Lynn Weingarten. Holy cow, this is another one that I was just so disgusted with by the end of it. This is also another one that has some of those similar themes of mean girls, horribly selfish girl main characters. This follows, again, two best friends, June and Delia. They were best friends, closer even, soulmates in a non-romantic sense. But then, of course, something happened and then they grew apart. And then one year later, Delia has actually committed suicide. And June is just racked with guilt. She is racked with guilt over it because she knows that their relationship disintegrated. And so she's feeling a lot of things but also she doesn't necessarily believe that Delia actually committed suicide. She believes that there's more to that story and so she actually believes that Delia could have been murdered and she takes it upon herself to investigate and the story kind of goes from there. This story is actually categorized as kind of like a mystery thriller suspense and it just did not follow through with that at all. At first I was really interested in the vibes because it was kind of giving me Pretty Little Liars meets 13 Reasons Why and I was interested in those vibes but the execution of it was poor. I say here not 
Not only was the execution of the story poor, so was the writing style. It was very basic, generic wording, poorly edited, and contained very clunky descriptions. And I actually give an example. Here is June describing her boyfriend. He is comfortable everywhere and tall and handsome in the sort of way where even if he isn't your type, you can probably appreciate the bones in his face and the fact that they are all exactly where they are supposed to be to make a face pleasing. What does that even mean? I remember this. I remember the horrific writing in this story. Holy cow. So many words crammed together to give such a vague and unhelpful description. And the whole book contains these poorly written and edited sentences and paragraphs. And then again, I talk about here how the characters were not developed. They were supremely unlikable. There was not one character in this book that I truly cared about. Delia was extremely obnoxious, selfish, manipulative. She was constantly playing with people's emotions. And June was a pushover, letting herself get lost in Delia's light and chaos. All in all, she wasn't very bright. It was clearly a toxic relationship when she was completely absorbed in. So there you have it. We're seeing a theme here. Older, young adult with toxic female friendships, unlikable characters, underdeveloped characters. Obviously, they just were not my thing. And they're not really anybody else's thing. Because like I said, this one also has a 3.43. This one, side effects may vary. And you must not miss by Katrina Leno. They were just awful. And I believe that they deserve to be further down on this list. Like, I believe that the girl from Blind River deserves to be ahead of all of these ones. Okay, and these last two are actually adult and more recent adult at that. One is one that I literally just finished the other day. And that's going to be the last one that I talked about. But first, let's talk about Such a Quiet Place by Megan Miranda. This has a 3.46 rating with over 53,000 ratings. So this one now is the most popular one that has been rated so far. I have a love-hate relationship with Megan Miranda. I can't describe it, but when I'm reading her books, I'm always for the most part solidly entertained. Like I'm in it, I'm into the story and I want to know what happens. But there's nothing mind-blowing or amazing about these stories. There's nothing incredible about her writing style. There's nothing super shocking about the twists or anything of that nature. There's nothing that makes these books stand out over anything else. But I just have fun reading them. They're just enjoyable reading experiences. But for the most part, they're kind of like meh, forgettable. Will I remember them? Probably not. But do I keep reading Megan Miranda? Yes. Such a Quiet Place is probably my least favorite of the Megan Mirandas that I've read. And it doesn't seem to be other people's favorites as well. Because like I said, this has a 3.46. And this was overall just probably one of the most generic thrillers that she has written. I opened my review with this book was remarkably mediocre. In fact, I would say it puts the meh in mediocre. So this is actually taking place within one neighborhood. So naturally, you're going to get all of the drama that comes from a small community full of neighbors up in everybody's business. And the neighborhood was really shaken when a couple within the neighborhood was brutally murdered. And a lot of people in the neighborhood with all of their testimony and stuff ended up implicating one of the residents there named Ruby Flesher. And so she was sent to jail. But now Ruby is back. Her conviction was overturned. And so she actually moves back to Hollow's Edge. And you can just imagine the drama that comes with all of that. And naturally Ruby's return also kind of stirs up a lot of secrets and lies that have been hidden and that were told way back then that implicated Ruby. And then when another murder occurs, things definitely escalate. And Harper, who was Ruby's roommate, tries to figure out what is happening. So overall, like I said, I felt this book was remarkable mediocre, very uninspired, very superficial, very little depth, very little meat to the story. You certainly don't get a lot of character development. There were also a, quite a lot of characters in here because you are dealing with the neighborhood. So you don't get those character connections. You don't get the emotionality that you might be looking for within a story. And ultimately, just like the plot overall itself was just very bleh. There wasn't really anything thrilling or suspenseful about it, in my opinion. And a lot of times it wasn't even all that entertaining. I didn't even really have all that much to say in my Goodreads review because it was that mediocre. It didn't even warm a lot of commentary. So if you are trying to get into Megan Miranda, this is not the place to start. Just from somebody who has read several Megan Mirandas and already has a very up and down relationship with her, I can say that this one truly, truly did not meet the mark. Like if this was the first Megan Miranda that I had ever read, I would never have continued with her as an author. Let's just put it that way. So this is definitely not the starting point for Megan Miranda. And then the last book for this list is actually The Writing Retreat by Julia Bartz. Now this is a crazy new release. This was just released in February and it only has a 3.48 rate. Rating, but it has a fair amount of ratings. It has almost 26,000. So a lot of people have read this book. It was definitely a hyped book. A lot of people were anticipating this. This was on a lot of people's anticipated reads list. So it was getting a lot of buzz for me included. And I was really digging the synopsis of the story. So the synopsis of the story is you're following our main character, Alex. She is 30 years old. She's in the publishing industry, but she's always wanted to be a writer. And as time goes on, it's looking like that's not going to happen, especially as within the past year, she suffered from a lot of writer's block after a falling out with her best friend friend 
rent. And then suddenly she's given an amazing opportunity. She has been selected to attend an exclusive writing retreat at the estate of her favorite author, Rosabella, who is a very well-known, outspoken feminist horror author. And so she and a handful of other women are going to live on Rosa's estate for a month and they are going to have this writing retreat. And the estate itself definitely has its own notorious history, like there were murders there and everything. So that's supposed to like add to the atmosphere and the suspense of this, right? But all of the girls get to the estate, they get settled, they meet Rosa, and suddenly a big bombshell is dropped on them. They are told that they are not going to be allowed to continue with any project that was in progress. They are going to have to start from scratch. They are going to be expected to produce 3,000 words a day. And by the end of the month, everybody's going to have a fully written novel. And the best novel is going to be given a six-figure publishing deal. So obviously this is life-changing. It definitely changes the tone, the vibe, the mood of the writing retreat, which is now a lot more stressful. It is a lot more competitive and all of the people are buckling down and they want to get this, right? They want to win this because this is life-changing. But there are some weird things that are happening at the estate and Rosa herself is very eccentric in a lot of ways. She has very unconventional methods, let's just say that. And then after one particularly unusual night, one of the participants goes missing. And so Alex, along with the other participants, they decide to find this missing resident. They want to know what happens to her. And that leads them to uncover a lot of crazy things going on. And I don't really want to say too terribly much more about that. But I would say a 3.48 is kind of right on target with my feelings for this story. I gave it a 3.5 and I gave it a 3.5 because it was definitely a memorable story to me. What was most memorable about this is that it went into a direction that I was not expecting. When I first read the synopsis, I thought that this was going to be very much an Agatha Christie-esque story, like One by One by Ruth Ware or An Unwanted Guest by Sherry Lapina, where you have this small group of people in an isolated setting and then one by one they start to die. That is what I was thinking that this was going to be. It's not what it was at all. This definitely took a different direction, which was a surprise and it was actually kind of a good surprise. But I had some technical issues with the story and some confusion about the story overall. So it didn't 100% work for me, but I didn't think that this deserved a three. So I think sitting at a 3.48 is pretty representative of my own thoughts and feelings of the story. I don't necessarily think it deserves much more than that. It was different than I thought it was going to be, but it wasn't better than I thought it was going to be. All right, y'all. So those are the 10 worst books that I've read according to Goodreads. I wanted to go ahead and talk about the fact that I'm in the middle of reading the current lowest rated book on my TBR at a 3.42 called The Last Invitation by Darby Kane. I'm not really going to say anything about it here just because I haven't finished it yet. I still have to like do a review and all of that stuff about it. This is the third Darby Kane that I've read. Her previous two novels were also some of the lowest on my TBRs and I loved them. I love Darby Kane's books for some reason and I don't understand why they're rated so low. But if I had included her book in here, she would have been, I believe, in like the top five of the books, the lowest rated books that I've ever read. So once I've completed her, she would have actually been on this list and the writing retreat would have been booted off. So I just kind of wanted to go ahead and mention it here that I am currently in the middle of one that would have been added to this list. But that's all I have for you today with this video. Please comment down below. And first of all, let me know some of the worst books that you've ever read according to Goodreads. Or let me know if you have read any of the books that I talked to you about here today and what your thoughts were. Or if you are a follower of limited words and you just want to leave an emoji, leave me like a skull and crossbones down below to represent poison, do not drink. And as always, if you like this video, or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I post two videos a week, occasionally three, if I have my shit together and a third video to film, and I would sure love to see you in one of those next videos. Bye guys. Thank you.